Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Pre-Game Show Network. I am Tali Carr, and it is time for another episode of The Big Boys. But I am mm, big boy singular. We have to get big boy plural. And there are the guys right there. It is Coach Carl Reed from 24-7 Sports. It is Uncle Neely from the Pre-Game Show Network. All right, let's get a uh, reaction. It's been a few days now, uh, uh -oh. but it, it was... It was what it was. Uh, Colorado going down, ugly fashion to Nebraska. Guys, your your takeaways from from that game? Well, obviously, you know when you talk about the slow start, you got to talk about the the pass protection of the offensive line. We got to see some much needed improvement there. We, you know, and you have to start the game quicker. Very slow start on both sides of the ball, and when you dig those kind of holes for yourself and you're putting yourself consistently behind the chains, you're consistently putting yourself behind in the game, it's really tough to develop any type of momentum, any type of chemistry. And then the Nebraska defense was able to just pin their ears back and rush the passer, um, and they got kind of out of hand from there. Absolutely. This team is uh, one and one, and the uh, the goals that Coach Prime established for this program going into this football year are still in place. Uh, that's one, to get Miss Peggy to a bowl game. That takes six wins. Uh, two, to make it to the Big 12 Conference Championship. That's still in play because we've yet to play a conference game. Uh, I hear what Coach Carl Reed is saying there, and I agree with everything he said. You know, when you start off slow and start digging yourself in a hole, uh, as my dad used to say, may rest in peace, when you're in a hole, you got to quit digging. And in that first half, we just could not quit digging. Uh, I said uh, leading into the game that Colorado – need to do a couple of things to win that tough game on the road. That's one, have four or less penalties. Uh, two, to have a takeaway. And then three, not turn the ball over. We failed at all three of those. Uh, by halftime, we were seven penalties for eight, 80 yards. Uh, Shadur threw a pick six, something very uncharacteristic for him. Uh, and then we also did not get any takeaways on our part. So as the wheels start to wobble and come off, by the time you get to halftime, you're looking at a 28-point deficit or so. It was just hard to come back on the road from that. Uh, but it's something that this program is going to learn from and build from and uh, go move on to the next opponent with a sense of renewed sense of urgency. Okay, we're going to do something kind of kind of unique here this week on the big boys. We're going to do a little game film, if you will. Now, these are just still shots. We're not going to play video because we would be in trouble for playing NBC's video. But we can, I think, maybe get away with showing a still shot. All right, so we have not rehearsed this. We have not gone over this. Uh, I'm just going to throw it out here to my experts, Coach Carl Reed. Uh, we will start here. Uh, I want to start with a play that was the – this was the third down, the first third down for Nebraska. Uh, you see the formation there. there. There's no one over center. I, I want you to explain the formation. This resulted in a long uh, run by Dylan Rayola and a first down in – Look, I'm not criticizing here. I, I just love to hear experts talk about ball. Coach, what well, do you see here on this play? Number one, when, you, when you're on a third down situation against a guy like Rayola, you're in a third and long, and you playing man across. So you see the corner at the top is in man, the corner at the bottom is in man, the slot corner is in man, and then you got the safeties over the top. Linebacker is going to be man over the back. The other backer is going to be man over the H back or tight end that you see lined up there in the backfield. So as the play progresses and the receivers push vertical, because every receiver is going to go past the first down marker to try to get first round, first down depth on his release. What that does is it leaves the quarterback unaccounted for in a man situation. So everybody's covered up. You got great coverage from the secondary guys. Everybody's locked on and nobody's coming open, but that middle of the field comes open and Rayola is able to tuck the ball and go to the first down because he's unaccounted for in the play. Well, Tali, football is a numbers game. So when in offense is going to have a little bit of advantage, you have to decide how you're going to defend things. You could go zone right here, or you can take one of the defenders and have them spy on the quarterback, but then you've got to decide what receiver you're going to leave open, and who is the least amount of threat. So one of the great things about being an offensive guy is if everybody you have out there is a threat when they put the ball in his hands, you, you're in a situation where everybody has to get covered up. So 
I think in that deal, it's just how do you want to defend it? Do you want to go zone and try to keep it underneath and you might leave a guy open? But if you bring zone, it's harder to bring pressure. You can go man, but if you go man, it's going to leave the quarterback runs open, but you feel like your defense can rally to a quarterback and stop the run unless he's a super duper dynamic rush guy. So it's just all about how you decide to defend that and play the numbers in that situation. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right, Coach Carl Reed. When you look at that picture, uh, you'll see the middle of the field is open. And a lot of times in defense, man, this is about pick your poison. Uh, you know, choose which one, which which bitter pill you want to swallow. Uh, when you look at the uh, the game film leading into this game, you know, we knew that this guy, you know, even though he's a freshman quarterback, you know he can make some key passes. So sometimes your defense is not necessarily set up uh, to stop what you think they're going to do. It's set up to invite them to do something that you want them to do. And in that situation with our, you know, strong secondary, you're inviting him to pass. Uh, when they were covered well, you know, he used his legs and you're counting on your D line or your linebackers because because keep this in mind, guys, and more importantly out there to the audience, no matter what scheme you're in, football is 11 on 11. And if a quarterback is able to make the first guy miss, the guy that was spying him, everybody else is occupied. He's going to get yards before people can come off those coverages and come make a tackle. Uh, but as Coach Carl Reese said, you know, it's zone, it's man, whichever way you're doing, something is going to be available and uh, I think from a game plan standpoint, what you knew about this quarterback, what you expected from him, when you look at the first quarter, second quarter, halftime stats, uh, hats off to Rob Livingston, his staff and his players. They really did a good job keeping those passing numbers down. He was not the prolific quarterback uh, that everybody thought he was going to be in that game. It was just Colorado's failure to maximize his opportunities. Okay, let's go to our second play that we're going to show you, and this is going to be the first touchdown run by Nebraska. Uh, formation a little different this time. Uh, again, Coach Carl Reed, what do you see here on this formation? Well, you got a kid, what's called a king left formation, so you had a fullback, you know, to the left hand left hand side of the field, and so what you you overload in that side, and it gives you an extra blocker. So when you when you had your play right here, you're able to run and you're able to overload at the point of attack from a blocking standpoint. And when you get a ball to your running back, crossing the quarterback's face to that side. And so, like I said in the last play on the pass play, everything is about numbers. Great players change numbers, though. So the advantage Colorado typically has when you have Travis Hunter is he can change the numbers because he occupies two guys. But in this formation right here, you really can just put a hat on a hat and then you can run the ball effectively out of this group. This would be a Kings left group. Okay, we're going to switch it up now. Again, we did not rehearse this, so that run actually does not go to the left. It goes to the right because the fullback pulls and, it, and he comes around. Uh, so that formation uh, gives you many options, if you will, um, if you put people in motion in Nebraska. Uh, Carl Reed made the most of it. Well, you got split zone action right here. So now what you're doing is instead of pressing it to the left, when that extra blocker goes back to the right, he seals that in man on the line of scrimmage that you had a play draw into. So it gives the back a two-way go. He can either press behind that left tackle on his inside hip and stay on the left-hand side of the field, or he can get behind the kickout block from the fullback that's kicking back out to the right and he can go in either direction. He's really, what you're teaching your back in this situation, you want him to run with his eyes, right? So as he takes the ball from the quarterback, he's going to look, and where he sees the most green grass, he's going to run in that direction. Absolutely, Coach Carl Reed, brilliant analysis. And it's the same thing with receivers. Should have been a passing play. You're going to go to the green brass when you see opportunities in a zone type coverage because you want to be able to sit down in your route and there's nobody around you. Tali, if you put that picture back up, you know, it's almost like a boxing match. Uh, you will learn, you know, that, that boxers work off the jab. The jab is setting you up for something to come. And one of the key differences uh, when you look at, uh, I'm sorry, the, the picture before that, Tali, before you uh, did your czar or the telestrator. One thing you'll see differently here, the middle ain't open no more. You learn from the previous play when the quarterback took off running that, okay, we're inside the red zone. I don't want this dynamic quarterback getting this crowd fired up and him running up the middle for a score. 
So let me move this linebacker here and keep an eye on him. But once again, it's still 11 on 11. You don't have a contractual agreement with the opponent as to what they're going to run. You know, you're just going off of film and formations and and flow of the game and making sure you don't make the same mistake twice as granting somebody an opportunity to score on you. Okay, this is Neely's favorite play. It is fourth and inches out of shotgun. Neely loves this. I'm being facetious here. Uh, so where we are with this screen grab, this still shot, Charlie Offerdahl has just taken the handoff from Shador Sanders. He has made one step, his first football move. He looks up, and this is what he sees. Uh, there's not a lot of green grass where he's going. Well, one thing you got to understand is who you're going against. And when your formation is going to take the play toward their strongest part of their defense, they got two interior defensive linemen who I believe are going to play on Sundays. Uh, and one of the failures of this particular play design was that it went toward the strength of their defense. Uh, not only is it fourth and one, and uh, you're using Charlie Offerdahl, one of the smaller of the backs, uh, you ran right to you know their strength. If you look at the hash toward the boundary up there, a lot of green grass up there. Uh, so maybe perhaps Carl Reed, you know, a jet sweep in that situation, you know, something utilizing the speed of Travis or or uh, uh, Lejonte West or Jimmy Horn. Uh, but when you go right up the middle to the strength of their defense, you're going to get the outcome that you have. Now, what we don't know is what was originally played was a check to this by the quarterback you know there's some nuances uh that we don't know outside looking in but i will tell you this when you look at offense coordinator pat Shermer, head coach coach prime Deion sanders they don't call things during the game that they haven't seen work at practice so there was something about that formation on defense there was something about the opportunity and something they worked on in practice that they thought that would be favorable uh but again you know we don't know if that's something that should do a check check to uh, and what led up to that circumstance. But we do know this, the smaller of the running backs ran into the strength of their defense, which is their two interior defensive linemen. Uh, and instead of converting a four for one, you probably lost three or four yards on that carry. I think one of the turning points of the game, though, is not that play. I think it's what happened after that. Defense gets a stop. So now they punting the ball to us. But on the punt return, we don't go catch the ball. We don't go field the punt. And I think that's something that a lot of young ball players don't understand the importance of that. Instead of you going and receiving the ball and catching it on the 18, 19 yard line, the ball hits the carpet and it rolls down to the one yard line. And then the next play is the, the pick six. You don't have enough room to operate your offense. So I've been telling that to a lot of high school kids, a lot of college guys. If you are the guy that is the guy returning punts, you give up hundreds of yards of field position over the course of the game from not going and fielding the punts. I don't care if you got a fair catch, everyone. It's more important that you go fair catch the ball than it is that you return it for a touchdown. It's a very, very critical part of the game. Coach, I love your your chronological order that uh, because it talks about the game flow and it really reaches my fourth box. You know, and I talked about four or less penalties that we couldn't turn the ball over and that we needed to have a takeaway. My fourth box for us winning, which I didn't get to mention because we didn't check the first three, was complimentary football. Uh, we failed at that horribly in the Nebraska game. Uh, you look at the, when you talk about return game, look at the big return that Jimmy Horn Jr. had for about 60 yards, took it to the other side of the 50 into Nebraska territory. And what do we do on the first play? We get a sack and lose about 15 yards. Uh, and so, you know, you had situations where the defense was putting the offense in a favorable position and nothing happened. You had situations where the special teams was putting uh, the offense in a favorable position and nothing happened. And then you also had the situation you're talking about where uh, special teams and hats off to Nebraska's punter. Uh, I thought he did a phenomenal job, you know, all night long. Uh, because the backspin he put on that ball, you, you're thinking it's going to roll into the end zone, and then it does a bounce and checks back and sits there to two, and it's exactly what had your quarterback standing in the end zone for a pick six. Okay, Neely, I, I wanted to ask you about this last week, and I, and I totally forgot. Uh, it didn't seem to be a problem in week one, but uh, Mata, on his field goals, I, I noticed against North Dakota State, that they, they were kind of low, but they got there. They went in. Uh, and we saw one block this week, this past weekend against Nebraska. Is, is that an issue, you think? 
it's a thing that's happening. It's a thing that he's aware of. It's a thing that Tommy Robinson, the special teams coordinator, is aware of. Uh, but it hasn't become an issue yet because he's still making way more than he misses and way more than gets blocked. Uh, but because people are becoming aware of the low trajectory, uh, it's something you see him spending time on in practice to make sure he can get a better driving angle on the ball to force it up higher. Uh, so I think it's going to be something that's going to be correctable uh, as the season goes on. But, you know, people are going to see that low kick and start, you know, moving guys into that interior line that got some leaping ability or some long arms, you know, for that reason. But for right now, when you look at what he has done, whether it's Jackson State or Colorado, uh, the number of kicks he's made versus misses, you're going to stick with them. Well, Colorado State, they want to beat Colorado bad, so I expect them to come out and play with very high intensity. It's a game that Coach Norvell really wants to win. The key to the game for Colorado is going to be, bottom line, protecting the passer. you got to protect your passer because you have special guys at the skill position, and if you give them time to get the ball off, he's going to be able to to really damage you in the passing game. So, it comes down to that. It comes down to to being to knowing who you're blocking, blocking them well at a high level. That's what Colorado has to fix and focus on going into Saturday. Neely, you what are you anticipating here? I'm anticipating a Colorado win. Uh, I'll start there, uh, but that win is predicated on what Coach Reed said. We've got to protect Shadur Sanders and give him the time. And I think Shadur will acknowledge. Uh, that he has to make some decision a little faster and get the ball out of his hands as well. Uh, I like matchup wise, you know, our linebackers to their running backs, our D line to their offensive line. I love our secondary to their to their receiver. I think uh, all units, the arrow points, you know, towards us. But as Coach Carl Reese said, this is a rivalry game. We're on the road, and they want this one bad. Uh, and we've got to want it better. You know, we have yet to start our conference schedule. You don't want to go into conference play one and three when you can go in two and one. So this Nebraska loss on the road has almost, not from a season goal standpoint, but just from an energy standpoint, uh, the Nebraska loss has just about made this Colorado State game a must win. And I think the Colorado Buffalo is gonna rise to the occasion. Uh, I think we have the twos and the two kit uh, that even with some players who are gonna have to sit this weekend, I think we have what it takes to get it done from a matchup standpoint. Uh, we know that Jay Norville wants to throw the ball. He wants to come out in 11 personnel. Uh, but again, there's no contract binding him to do that. We just know his tendencies. So our secondary is going to have to be ready. And linebackers are going to not have to fall for eye candy and movement and make sure they stay in their assignments and their gaps uh, because you don't want to get exploited with some play action over the top. Uh, the absence of Shiloh Sanders, he's going to be out a, a few weeks at the very least um, after his forearm injury, had surgery over the weekend. Uh, Carl, how much will Colorado miss uh, Shiloh Sanders in that secondary? You're going to miss him a lot because he makes all the calls on the back end of the defense. So as good as that secondary is, he's the one who puts everybody in position and makes the calls and the checks on the back end. So whoever is going to take on that responsibility, they have a bigger job on the mental side of the game, even more so than the physical side. Neely? Yeah, I, I concur. Uh, I, I do appreciate uh, the depth that Colorado has developed here. Uh, you know, you have Cameron Silman Craig, who came over from Jackson State, uh, who can fill in that role nicely. You got Carter Stottmeyer, uh, whose father, you know, played in the NFL with Coach Prime and Coach Mathis, you know, at the Cowboys. Uh, and so you have uh, DJ McKinney. You got a number of names out there who've gotten some playing experience under their belt and had some big plays after uh, Shiloh went out in this particular game. So the experience is there to make sure that his absence is negligible. But you're going to miss him because not only, as Coach Reed said, uh, is he the mental guy back there putting people in their places, he's also the spark plug. Uh, you know, you don't forget the pick six that he got last year that really energized the team. Uh, and don't forget what he's able to do on the bench and in the locker room. So uh, hopefully he'll be able to uh, to make the trip and still be somewhat of an extension of a coach on the sidelines there. But it's hard to replace the energy and talent that the Shiloh Sanders brings. Offensive line, where where are we? Uh, week one, we thought, okay, th this thing is is together. Uh, they kept Shadur Sanders upright. Uh, week two, it reared its ugly head again, and and it was an issue. Um, do we know where we are with the offensive line right now? I know there's going to be some shakeups. Uh, I know that uh, Coach Field Lodeholt has high expectations for the unit. 
Uh, and I know that he lives by the motto if, of if you're not producing, uh, there's going to be some reducing. So uh, we're a production unit. If you don't have production, you get reduction. And we failed to produce on the offensive line in Nebraska. So I think you're going to see a different look, a different unit out there uh, with Colorado State. But I also believe that as the game goes on, you'll get back to that familiar group that was out there as well. Uh, we just have to play better. Now, having said that, we have to recognize that as bad as it was in Nebraska, this offensive line is still more talented, has more depth than where we were last year. So being at this spot of one and one, one loss under the belt, having a deficient offensive line play for one game is not time to hit the panic button and throw everybody away. It's time to rise to the occasion and make sure you go to Colorado State ready to perform uh, because right after Colorado State going 1-0 and there, you start conference play, and it's, it's for real then. You know, with the offensive line, like like Neely said, there will be a, a personnel change here or there. And you got to remember, it takes the offensive line longer to gel than any position in football. You have new guys, Jordan Seton, as talented as he is, he's still a freshman. So they got to get communication together, and they have to be able to communicate well, especially see when you're seeing stunts and twists. One thing that I like to see, I like sometimes to take some of the pressure off of those guys in man-on-man situations, and I like to see a little bit more zone blocking. You can go four-man slide. You can go three-man slide. That'll help Jordan Seton where he doesn't have to necessarily handle the speed rush by himself. He can post that guy on the outside, and you can slide, and, and that helps the middle of the defense because sometimes you get a little pressure from those A-gaps, that guy that's between the center in the guard so you can zone those guys up so they can help each other a little more. But other than that, you still have to play football. You still have to go out there and put a hat on a hat and block your man. And so that group is going to have to continue to gel throughout the season. And I think that I think that they're going to do that. I mean, I, they know that they're the key to it. Those guys have played a lot of football before they came in and have had a lot of success. Jordan Zeton is a young guy. He's going to continue to improve. Week by week, we still have to remember that he's a freshman and it's the toughest position for a freshman to play is the offensive line because of the physicality of what's going on out there. And so from that standpoint, I think as soon as they get that figured out, they're going to really take off offensively because you still had the best two players in college football and and Shador and Travis. Running, the running game. What do we think we know about the running game two games in? Uh, that we got to try, that we have to have some deliberate runs. Uh, I know that uh, Coach Prime says, you know, that, uh, you know, sometimes it's just not working, so why bother? But I think this is the week that you come out early and try to establish that dominance, and it really dovetails perfectly into what Coach Reed was just talking about. That starts with the offensive line. I think most offensive line will rather go forward than backwards, so they're all in on run blocking. Uh, if they can set the tone early and open up some gaps for for a running back or two, it's really going to make the pass protection easy because now the defense is going to be reluctant uh, to just come full force like that. Uh, back on that, just specifics of the offensive line, Coach Reed, uh, when you talk about Jordan, the true freshman, probably the only true freshman starting on an offensive line in, in big boy college football, uh, I think one of the things you can look for is perhaps Tyler Brown, uh, a.k.a. Rock, uh, to move over to – uh, left guard where he can help with the communication in the scheme there uh, with his experience and his interior play as well. So having said all that, I just believe we get to Colorado State, you're going to see a different uh, five out there, six out there, and then seven rotation with the offensive line. And I think they'll be ready to open up some gaps for the run game as well. Carl, what, what have you seen with the run game? Uh, when you look at the data, when what your eyes are telling you, what, what have you seen the first couple of weeks? When you run the ball, it's only two ways to do it. You either spread everybody out or you compact the box and you bring extra guys in, tight ends and age backs and whatnot. And you have to decide which way you're going to do it. Now, when you're spread out, you have less guys in the box. You're typically going to have five to play six. So I think in order to really have success running the ball, at times you're going to have to play with a tight end or age back to put that extra hat in there because Shador is not a zone read guy. And so guys who zone read and run a lot, that takes care of that extra defender in the box. And then when you have that, when you bring the extra guys in, it also gives you advantage because it forces them to take a guy out of passing lane and it clears up some things for Travis Hunter and uh, Jimmy Horn. And so Shador can always get you in the right play out of that set. 
Sounds like a winning combination. Uh, Neely, you always have to give us the nuts and bolts. The game is this weekend. We, we've seen it on a couple of different networks. Where do we watch the game this weekend? <laughs> Man, you put me on the spot because I totally forgot which network uh, is covering it this weekend. I dare say it's CBS. I think this is the this is the CBS game because last week was NBC. And yeah, it's the CBS game because Baylor is going to be Fox uh, the week after. So the first four games coming out of the shoot, you know, all getting national primetime coverage. Uh, and let me say this, man, if I can put another nail on that, that run game talk. Uh, Coach Reed, you know, you said it best when you talk about having the two most dynamic players in college football and Shadur Sanders and Travis Hunter. I don't think there's a magical solution to the number of running plays you have to do, you know, whether this is going to be 60, 40, 50, 50, or any kind of thing like that. I think you have to establish a run game. So when you get these leads, you can better control the clock. And when you need to sub people out and get people rest, that you have other plays you can run. But know this and know this well. When you have Travis Hunter and you have Shadur Sanders and you got Jimmy Horn Jr. and Will Shepard, LeJonte Wester, et cetera, et cetera, the ball is going to be in the quarterback's hands more times it's going to be in the running back's hands. I'm going to say this too. I learned this from Bobby Petrino years ago when I was a high school coach. He had a philosophy called feed the stud. And what that meant was whoever the three best players on offense were, those were the three guys who were going to be touching the ball 90% of the time. Some years those guys are receivers. Some years those guys are running backs. Some years, hopefully, as always, your quarterback is in that mix. So if you're looking at Travis Hunter, Jimmy Horn, Shador Sanders, I want those three guys involved with the play every single down, to be totally honest with you. And so we're going to have to run some to keep them honest, but at the same time, I'm looking for those guys to touch the ball 90% of the time when I'm out there. And just to uh, clarify and to say Neely was right, it is CBS this weekend. Neely, the first four weeks, it went ESPN, NBC, CBS, Fox, like every everybody wants to have their hand in the cookie jar. That's that 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 is, that is the four network special right there. Yeah, it's it's what we call the prime effect. Uh, you know, you have uh, two of those games are going to be at home, two on the road. Just so happens that the two in the middle are road games. You travel to Nebraska, uh, tough place to play. You're going to travel to Colorado State for your in-state rival. Uh, and then you have the opening of the Big 12 conference play with Baylor coming to town. Uh, and so all four of those games on network TV, it's going to give people a lot of eyeballs and chances to see what Coach Prime is building here. And then, of course, it always brings out the critics uh, in the Sunday morning quarterbacks as well. Uh, but he's built for it. He, he's done the minor scrutiny, doesn't mind talking about it at his, his weekly press conferences. Uh, but this, again, I say because of that Nebraska loss, because you don't want to go into conference play, uh, you know, one and two, uh, you're going to check this box, man, as a must win from a psychological standpoint, uh, certainly not from a goal standpoint, because it doesn't have any impact or bearing on Big 12 conference play championship. Uh, but you want to get six six wins to get Miss Peggy to a bowl game. Uh, you want to be in Dallas that first weekend in December for the Big 12. Uh, and it's hard to do that when you go one and three in non-conference play. Absolutely. Uh, and, and I will say this as we get out of here. Uh, Coach Prime talked about this in his press conference. There is so much media out there, and uh, to be defined as media now just means you have a mouth and an internet connection. Um, the the narrative that took off that Shadur Sanders quit on the team, he left the game, you know, he stormed off like a petulant. The doctors told him to go to the back. <laughs> there were other players that went with them. And, and the amount of inside sources, and I love the inside sources in Colorado, not named Neely, uh, that said all the players said, oh, he quit on the team. They're losing the locker room. Like, guys, it, it is I, – I don't even know how. Like, I don't even know how that you go about, like, casually following uh, some of this stuff. Like, there, there, there is more lies than truth, like, at this point. And, and we're just two weeks in. And is, is this a perfect football team? No, it's not. There, there's not a perfect team out there. Uh, but – Stay with your good uncle here. He's gonna he's gonna give it to you straight. Absolutely. You know, uh, I'm sorry, Coach Reed. Uh, one of the things we also got to address is the the rumor that Coach Prime mandated that the band stop playing the school fight song and instead play Shadur's song when he leads the team to a score. 
just something that's totally not true, uh, has no basis whatsoever. And you have a collective effort out there in quote unquote so-called journalists who would rather be first and be right. Uh, but then you also have a deliberate intent out there that's just all about clickbait. They know it's wrong, but they just put it out there from a assumption standpoint because the eyeball test matches it. Like for instance, when Shadur does score here Folsom, they do play his song Perfect Timing. And so you have like the evidence that is being played, but the justification and reason why it's being played is totally falsified. Uh, the same thing with him going in early uh, with about two minutes left, waited on that new rule, which is the two minute, you know, it's not a two minute warning in college football, it's a two minute uh, timeout uh, for media. And that's when he chose to walk in under doctor's orders. But there was also a scrutiny of security to it uh, because all week long we've been here in Nebraska had planned to rush the field. And why would you leave your quarterback who had just got banged up out there for everybody to come over the rails uh, and surround? So uh, the fact that you take him going in on the medical device and on the security device to use that as grounds to say he's quitting on the team, you obviously has not, have not followed Shadur Sanders or anything going on, whether he was at Jackson State or Colorado, if you think that's even in him whatsoever. You know, the great thing about sports is that you have all of these fans, these fanatical people who who they watch the games, they follow the games, but they don't really know what's going on inside the locker room and they don't know what's going on as a team. And so from a team standpoint, it's three battles that every team faces daily. That's division within, outside influences in the competition you face. If you can make sure you don't have any division within, if you can make sure that you don't let the outside influences come inside the team, then the only thing you have to worry about is the competition that you face and you'll be in good shape. We know that we can't we can't pay attention to what people outside the locker room say when you're a coach or you're a player on a football team. But I do love the fan engagement. It's why we're able to do these type of shows. It's why we're able to be on television and why we're in demand. And it's why football has become one of the greatest games out there that there is. You know, I, I love uh, I love it as well. And uh, we'll go on this. Guys, I was at my daughter's middle school football game. She's a cheerleader, so I just go to support her. Uh, but the team is getting better. Uh, they're getting better. So they were winning yesterday. Uh, they were playing this other team, and uh, <laughs> the visiting team <laughs> coach, uh, right before halftime, this dad comes down the stands. He finds his son on the sideline. Come here, come here. I got and and the and the son kind of sheepishly looked around, like you know, my coach is over there. I don't want to go. And anyway, his dad was come here, and he's pointing and talking. And I thought to myself, sir. Carl Reed is very disappointed in you right now. I'm disappointed. <laughs> I'm disappointed. And this is a callback to last week's show where we talked about where Coach Reed posted on social media. In all his years of football, he has never seen any good advice given at the fence line. <laughs> never. <laughs> but yet it goes on. All right, Colorado State this weekend. The game is on CBS. I think you can even see it on Paramount Plus. So if you've, uh, if you've cut the cord and you're just streaming, uh, you should have a way uh, to find the game. Uh, and you can definitely find us here on the Pregame Show Network. We will be talking about it. For Coach Carl Reed, for Uncle Neely, I'm Tali Carr in Atlanta. We'll see you guys next time around.